Let's take a look at optimizing interior scenes in three steps. First, we'll maximize the amount of light in our scene while still maintaining good contrast. Then, we'll look at some flexible denoising options. Last, I'll talk about a few render parameters I use the most to optimize scene render times. If you've ever worked on interiors, you know they can be notoriously difficult to denoise, especially in situations like this where we only have a single opening and we're lighting the room with an HDRI image. Noise in the rendering is all about light. When we have a lot of noise, it usually means one of two things. Either we don't have enough samples or we don't have enough light. Adding more samples adds more computing time. In this particular scene, it really doesn't matter how many samples we add. This scene could render forever and we're just not getting the results we need. I'm using a single RTX 2080 card to render and I'd like to keep the render time below a minute just to prove a point. So every rendering you see in this video was forced to stop rendering before one minute. In reality, you may have more than a minute to let things render, but the techniques you'll learn in this video will bring your render times down regardless. So what else can we do to eliminate noise? Well, like I said, noise is about light. So something else we can try is to get more light into our scene. A common beginner mistake is to just start adding a bunch of lights everywhere. What this can do is start to make your scene feel flat, unrealistic, and washed out. While there may be more than one light source in a real daytime interior, it's not likely to have so many competing in intensity. Typically, we want what's called a key light or a main light. If we just add a bunch of lights, what you end up with is a very low contrast environment. And in this case, where all of our light is meant to come from the window, it's unconvincing. So to get more light into our scene, we need to focus on where the light's coming from, the window. Some render engines do this by default nowadays, while some still give us the flexibility to define this ourselves. What we can do to define where the samples should be focused is to add a light portal. In Blender, just add an area light, change it to a rectangular shape, fit it to the window opening, and check this box in the light object properties called portal. Immediately, you may see improvement. We've harnessed where the samples are being focused in the scene, through the window, which is helpful, but if this is as far as you can take things, you may be in trouble. We're still not getting the amount of light we need. So what we need to do now is look at things from the material level. Of course, light should be primarily coming in through the glass. It should also bleed in through the curtain. In our render software, we told the glass to be a glass material, but glass is complex. It not only blocks light, it refracts and redirects it. That would be a lot to compute. So for simplicity, the software decided to give it a shadow, which is just blocking the light entirely. This actually looks good in many cases for glass, which is why it's default, but for a window, we need light coming through. To do that, let's add a mix shader. This is exactly what it sounds like. It will mix between two shaders. The first is our glass. This is visually what we want the glass to look like. The second is a transparent shader, which is essentially invisible. Now, we need to tell the software to use this first option when we're looking at the glass, but to use this second option when light needs to pass through it. To do that, we need a very useful node called the light path node. Let's go from something called is shadow ray and plug it into our mix shader node. All that that does is tell the shader that, hey, if this is about to cast a shadow, use transparency, make it invisible. For everything else, like reflection in the window, for instance, just use this glass node. Immediately, you should see some more light enter the scene. The rest of the window, the frame, is of course blocking some light, but that's fine. That's what we'd expect in the real world too. To take things even further though, let's let some light through our curtain as well with the same exact approach. My curtain shader is pretty simple. It's a diffuse node added to a translucency node. That gives it this sort of translucent look while still having a diffused fabric kind of look. To let light through, again, we just need to add a mix shader, a transparent shader, and a light path node.
plug is shadow ray into the factor and watch the light start pouring in. In my scene, I darkened the translucent shader color just so the curtain isn't looking so radioactive bright. This can happen now that we've let the light pass through freely without casting shadow. Now if we render, we're getting something that's much closer to being usable. To really make this shine though, let's denoise the image. And I don't mean just turning on denoise. That works in some cases, but oftentimes it can destroy detail where we want to keep it. For instance, we probably want to denoise the walls more aggressively than we might denoise the sofa or the rug. In most interior scenes, I find it helpful to have at least two denoise passes, one for the walls and one for everything else. I'll show you now how to set it up with just a few clicks in the compositor. First, we need a way to separate out objects while compositing, sort of like selection masks in Photoshop. This is what's commonly known as a crypto mat pass or a puzzle mat. To enable it, simply go to view layers and check under crypto mat material. This will give every unique material, like our wall material, its own selection mask. In the render properties, make sure denoise is turned on and let's give everything a render. Like I said, by default, it will just denoise everything. This eats up a lot of detail we don't want it to, so in the compositor, we can mix back in the original noisy image. This is called noisy image, and to mix it, we need, well, a mix node. Mix the denoised image with the noisy one and control the factor. I can't really give you a magic number, but test out what looks good for your scene. Like I said though, we want to denoise the walls in particular more. Then we want to denoise everything else. To do that, just copy the mix node and set it up with a value that you want for the wall denoising. So we have one mix node that represents the walls and one that represents everything else. We can just mix those together with, you probably guessed it by now, another mix node. To isolate the walls, let's use our CryptoMat selection layers. To get that, just add a CryptoMat node. Take our image and plug it into image on the CryptoMat node. The node has an output called pick. Just run this into the view node. You'll see a psychedelic version of our room. Each material has its own selection mask, just like we wanted. Hit the plus button to add a layer, and then just click on the wall. Now, the factor of this final mix node will be our crypto mat output called mat. This is simply just a black and white image now. Anywhere where it's a wall, it's white. Everything else is black. In other words, everything that's a wall gets denoised by this amount while everything else gets denoised by this. You don't have to stop at just the wall. You could repeat this process to separate out any number of problematic objects in the scene. So denoising becomes more of a thoughtful and purposeful approach, not just a blanket approach to fix everything with the same value. For our last step, to push optimizations even further, I encourage experimenting with the following parameters. I can't really give you magic numbers again on any parameters because every scene is different, but here are some things to know. Under render properties, go to sampling. You can hover over any property to read up on what it does. Here are the ones I change the most. Noise threshold is the threshold before cycles stops shooting out samples. A very low number will increase render time. The default is 0.01. Sometimes I double that and make it 0 0.02 for faster render time. Under light paths, the defaults are typically good settings. You might need to increase transparency since we had all of those layers of transparent objects with the glass and the curtain. I bumped mine to 24 just to be safe. This should have minimal impact on render time. Under clamping, you might want to do some quick tests. Typically, you don't want to clamp direct light. That can really break the light intensity values in the scene. Indirect light is clamped at 10 by default. A lower number might help to eliminate the fireflies in the scene from indirect light bounces. I often set mine to five or maybe even three. Again, it's just good to test these numbers out. Under film, you can test out the pixel filter number. By default, it's 1.5 pixels. This really isn't about performance, but just so you know, I like to set mine to one pixel in a lot of cases. I just feel the rendering is a bit more crisp. Under performance, I don't usually touch this unless I have a scene that takes forever to load into the engine. For example, if I have a displacement or a particle system, I turn on persistent data. This just means it loads in once and then it stays in the memory cache so future frames are quicker. 
you can leave it off since we're just doing one still frame. And that's it. With a render time in under one minute, we went from rendering this to this. The rendering was 1920 by 1080 pixels. Since this is a 4K video, I also made this final version which took a few minutes to render and I did some post on it as well. I do a lot of interior renderings, oftentimes on just my single GPU. And people often are surprised to hear that I don't really let things render for more than about five minutes max. And now you know how. As always, let me know if you have any questions in the comments section and check out the links that I leave there. Thanks for watching.